Hey, good afternoon, church. We're going to hear the message about Saul or Paul of Tarsus. This is the fifth message of our 10 series of messages entitled One in the Body. I know that we have been, uh, I guess, um, interrupted by a lot of events that happened. Last Sunday, we celebrated our Independence Day. How was your July 4th? Right. Did you watch some fireworks? Uh, you ate a lot of barbecue. Uh, but today, church, we're going to focus on this one particular person, this dear, this dear man of God, and his name is Apostle Paul. Just to, to recap and give us a little bit of review, I know it's been a while since we have continued this uh, series of message. So we're going to, to uh, see and, and, and try to, to review what we have learned in the past. We've been studying the book of Acts, uh, the only book of history, and... Um, we said that um, we are looking at the patterns, right? Patterns of conversion. How one can be added into the body. You know, uh, God, when, when He gave us the New Testament, He didn't leave us just uh, without any examples or models to follow. You know, when we read the Gospel, uh, when we read the Epistles, there's this one book in between the Gospels and the Epistles. It's called the Book of Acts, which is the only book of history that showed us the history of the church that showed us how one can be added into the body. You know, I, say, I always say that pictures is worth a thousand words. Have you heard about uh, the word or the study um, that says, the study that uh, tells us about this word ornithology? Anybody knows about, about this, this word ornithology? This is about the study of birds, right? I just... Uh, came to my mind because Pastor Moses mentioned about the hummingbird, right? So, uh, ornithology is the uh, study of birds, right? So, there's one, one professor who was teaching this class, and he was like a strict professor, and he told this, this uh, class, class, we're going to have a, a, a big test, a big exam. It's going to be very hard, so you need to prepare for it. So, comes uh, the day of the examination, and the professor just handed out blank pieces of piece, one blank piece of paper, and he he came out with five cages covered from top to almost bottom, with just an inch or an inch inch and a half um, open from the bottom, where you can see the spindly, scrawny legs of the birds. And the professor said, "Okay, class, this is how we're going to do it. You can look at the cage." and observe the legs of the birds, and you tell me, write a paragraph each for each of the five cages to identify which bird this is. So one student said, you know, this is crazy, right? He threw up all the papers in the air, and he was about to leave the classroom. And the professor stopped him. Young man, stop! And he did stop, right? And the professor said, can you tell me your name so I can fail you? And this uh, young man said, uh, he turned around, took off his shoes and socks, lifted up his uh, pants and said, you tell me, professor. Right? So it's, it's the example that uh, the professor showed. Right? In the same token, in the book of Acts, the Bible tells us, illustrated to us how one can be added into the body. So the book of Acts tells us in the very first chapter, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, we, we heard the message about the 3,000 on Pentecost, right? When, when the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire, came down to the apostles and Peter rose up and gave the best sermon of his life. And Acts chapter 2, verse 37 tells us that the Jews asked the question, what shall we do? And Peter replied in verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we can clearly see on the 3,000 on Pentecost that the pattern of how one can be added to the body, the pattern on one, how one can be converted, you, need, you must believe. Believe you know, in, our, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is very important. You need to repent from your sins in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and you need to be baptized for the remissions of your sins so you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, the story continues in the Solomon's colony. 
And in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, uh, during that time, the, the um, believers grew in numbers until up to 5,000. So we know that there were 2,000 on Solomon's porch who were added to the body. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, we heard the scripture tells us, uh, repent and be ye converted. Right? Repent, the same thing in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and be ye baptized. Then in Acts chapter 4, the, um, the church grew in numbers and persecution started. Right? Chap- chapter 5, we saw the story of Ananias and Sapphira or Sapphira. Acts chapter 6, we saw there that the, because of the numbers of the believers are growing, the church through the elders raised up deacons. Right? So we know one of the deacons was Stephen. So in the story in chapter 7, we, we saw there and we read the stoning of Stephen. And in chapter 8, because Christianity were being persecu- or Christians were being persecuted, they scattered. Right? It, was, it was the plan of God so that the, the word of God can scatter not only in, in Jerusalem, in all Judea, but in Samaria and all the parts of the world. We, we saw this, the story about uh, Philip when he went to Samaria. Acts chapter 8, verse 12, and many believed and were baptized, both men and women. And the Sunday before we had those uh, continuous uh, special Sundays, right? We have the tributes to the graduates, and, and then we have last Sunday, we have our Independence Day. We heard the message about the Ethiopian eunuch. And this is very important, right? Because from 3,000 to 2,000 to the whole city, there's just only one person who was converted, and this was the Ethiopian eunuch. And he said, the scripture tells us in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, stop, right? What is keeping me from being baptized? There's water here. Philip said, if you believe in your heart, then you can be baptized. So the pattern is consistent. Believe, repent, and baptize. And today, church, it is my joy and honor to, to discuss and share with you the conversion of Saul to Paul. You know, this man of God who is the chief persecutor of Christians. So when he converted to Christianity, he became the persecuted. The persecutor became the persecuted. And, and the, the narrative of the conversion of Paul, you know, this is a big deal, right? Because this is Apostle Paul He's an apostle, and he wrote 13 epistles. Right? If, you are, if you know your 27 books of the New Testament, right? Paul wrote, starting with um, Romans, right? 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. That's 13. And then it can be 14 because the book of Hebrews is still disputed. Right? So this is very important because Paul has written to many churches, has, has instituted different churches. So how he was added to the body, how he was converted is very important because this is part of his teaching as well. You know, the greatest teaching that people would always remember is in his writings to the Christians in Ephesus, right? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Right? So this is very important because most people would uh, quote that. Paul wrote that. It is by grace you have been saved by faith, not by works, right? It is not on your own. Right? It is the gift of God so that no man can bo- boast. In verse 10, it continues, right? For we are God's workmanship. Right? We are God's masterpiece, created to do good works, which God has prepared for us in advance. But, but today, church, there's, there are three places where you can find in the book of Acts only, in the only book of history in the New Testament, there is only, uh, there's three places where you can find the narrative of the conversion of Apostle Paul. How is that? It's a big deal. It's very important. Not that Paul is more important than the Ethiopian eunuch, but we have to, to understand, right? The first one is in Acts chapter 9. If you have your Bibles with you, it's important for you to take them out, right? 
Uh, Acts chapter 9, this was the narration of Luke himself. Right? Luke was the one writing. He's the author of the book of Acts. Then you, you, have, you can find Paul himself doing his own witnessing and testimony of his life in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 22, you will find there uh, uh, the conversion of Apostle Paul as well. And, and in Acts chapter 26, you can also find there, uh, because Paul was now facing King Agrippa, Governor Festus, and, and Beatrice, the wife, uh, and he needed to defend himself against uh, King Agrippa, and so he again gave his personal testimony. So church, this afternoon... We're going to understand the conversion of Apostle Paul. Can you imagine this? Right? We, we have not really seen how the other 12 apostles, you know, Peter, James, John, and the rest of the 12 apostles were converted. Right? But here in the book of Acts, the conversion of Apostle Paul is shown to us. Now, the first thing I would like to share with you is the harmony of the conversion of Saul. So again... There are three places you can find the conversion of, of Paul or Saul to Paul. Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. It is very important because some, some portions have some details that we needed, we needed so that we can fully grasp and understand how one can be truly added to the body. So, the narrative, let's just go through this church, right? Saul was on his way to Damascus. That was the, the premise, right? Saul was the chief persecutor, right? He, he, he was a, a, a Pharisee, and he, he was really intent, his intention to go to Damascus, right? Uh, was actually to persecute Christians, to, to go to the synagogues, and if there would be some followers of the way, he would pick them up, right, and put them into prison. So Saul was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians, can you imagine this? Right? That was the intent of Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 1 through 2, chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, the Scripture tells us, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. You know, Paul was a very zealous man. So whatever he's up to, whatever he's, ta- he's tasked to do, he gives it his all, Right? So he was the persecutor of Christians, so he will really persecute the Christians the best of his ability. So he was really, um, you know, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, right? Damascus is in Syria, right? So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. That was the mission of Apostle Paul. That's the reason why he was on his way to Damascus. But we know something happened on his way to Damascus. Something miraculous happened on his way to Damascus. When a light shone around him from heaven. I know we probably just you know, know this story that Paul was a chief persecutor. There was this light, but we're going to really embrace the details. And we will have a, two questions that are very important for us to understand so that we can fully embrace how one can be added to the body. And not only, you know, a, a person uh, that, you know, we don't know. This is Apostle Paul himself who wrote, as I mentioned, 13 books of the New Testament. So, his life testimony should be consistent to the works of his hand, to whatever, whatever he wrote. It should be consistent. So if we see how he was converted, then we will understand the meaning of the things that he wrote. Right? So verse 3, the scripture continues, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. So there was this bright light, blinding light. Right? Actually, it was really a blinding light because it left him blind for three days. Right? And then a voice speak to Paul in Hebrew and identifying himself as the voice of Jesus. Listen to this church in verses 4 to 5. Because of this light, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Soul, soul, why do you persecute me? Can you imagine that? 
I believe in my heart that um, before most of us knew Jesus Christ in our lives, we are on our way to Damascus ourselves. Right? In one way, shape, or form, we are persecuting Jesus Christ in our lives. Would you agree with me, church? Would you, I submit that to you? Right? We are putting Him to shame whenever we deny Him in our lives. Right? And so this question is, is also a question for all of us before we knew our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so, why do you persecute me? Verse 5, the story continues, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. So, at this point in time, Paul didn't have any clue who that voice was that he heard. But if you look at the scriptures, it was in uppercase L. So, it's a general, someone who is in a higher authority. right? And then, Verse 5 continues, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Paul was surprised, right? He was blinded and he heard a voice. And the word Lord, as I mentioned, was in uppercase meaning he knew that there was a higher authority, a higher power, a higher reality that he heard a voice from and asking him that why did he persecute him? Right? So Jesus then tells souls you know, why he has appeared to him. So from Acts chapter 9, the great thing about the harmony of these narratives is we can jump from one uh, story to another and still have a, a, a continuous and a holistic understanding of the conversion of Apostle Paul. Look at Acts chapter 26, verses 16 through 18. Now, remember the background of this. Paul is talking to King Agrippa, right? Paul was being accused by the Jews during that time. And Paul was defending himself, and this was part of his defense. He said, uh, after he was telling uh, King Agrippa how he was called by Jesus Christ, right? and this was why he was called, right? In verse 16 of Acts chapter 26, the scripture tells us, Now get up and stand on your feet. This is the reason why Jesus appeared to Paul. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant servant, and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. That's why Apostle Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, right? That was the, the mandate given to, to Paul by Jesus Christ himself. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So, the mandate of Jesus Christ, it was not found in Acts chapter 9, as detailed as Acts chapter 26. It was not found in Acts chapter 22, as detailed as it was found in Acts chapter 26. But in Acts chapter 26, it is clear to Paul why Jesus appeared to him. Right? He will be the apostles to the Gentiles, right? To rescue the Gentiles, right? So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a great story. We have, we have three references and it makes the whole story really complete and clear to see and understand. Going back to, to Acts chapter 9, verse 6, can you imagine this, right? Paul, he has a mission to persecute Christians. And all of a sudden, this, this miraculous thing happened in his life. He was called by Jesus Christ to do the reverse, right? He was actually going to save those who he is persecuting. Are you following church? That's his mission now. His mission changed, right? From being persecutor of Christians, right? Acts chapter 9, verse 6, in the NIV translation, Scripture continues, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So the story is, is like this. On his way to Damascus, there was this bright light. He got blinded. He fell down. He heard a voice. Right? He didn't know what to do. But the, the, the voice also continued to tell him to get up right? and go to Damascus. And in Damascus, wait there because someone will come and tell him what to do. Right? In chapter 22, verse 10, the scripture continues, right? What shall I do, Lord? This is a different portion. That's why in, 
9 and chapter 9, verse 6, it was answered there, but in chapter 22, verse 10, he asked, What shall I do, Lord? I asked, Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told that you have been assigned to do. So Paul now was on his way to Damascus as the story continues. Saul arrives in Damascus. In verses 8 to 9, we can read the scripture itself tells us, Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. He got blinded by the bright light. He needed some people to help him, to assist him, to walk so that he can reach Damascus, right? So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Right? For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink. So what, what do you think Paul did? In Acts, this is Acts chapter 9. The narrative is not really clear on what Paul did. The narrative only told us he was blind for three days and he did not eat. He did not drink. But one can surmise that because he did not eat or drink, he probably has been fasting during that time. Would you think so? Right? But it was not mentioned here, right? So, he was there in Damascus. He was going to wait as the Lord instructed him. Right? So, the Lord sends Ananias to Saul. Who is Ananias? Ananias, he was a disciple in Damascus. So Ananias had, uh, I guess, the, the assignment to go to Apostle Paul. Can you, can you imagine this, right? If you were Ananias, Paul has a letter from the chief priest to go to the synagogue, right? If you were Ananias and you were in the synagogue and Paul got there and saw you, you know, without all of these things happening, what will Paul do to you if you're Ananias? Paul will take you, right? and bring you to prison in Jerusalem. That was the letter he had, right? So, everyone who is a follower of the way should get out of the way of Paul. Otherwise, they will be brought to Jerusalem in prison. But God told Ananias, the reverse, you actually have to go to Paul or to Saul. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the assignment of Ananias? You would be afraid, right? So in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 17 through 18, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Right? Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me right, so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Again, this was in Acts chapter 9. Right? So we knew what happened here was Ananias came, right? Ananias put his hand on brother uh, Saul, right? And he said, uh, that Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent him. Right? And as soon as he's done speaking, the scales, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And Paul could see again. And subsequently what happened? He got up and was baptized. That was the, the blow-by-blow account of Luke, Dr. Luke. Right? Oh, what does this mean, right? What does this mean? In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, that same thing, right? If you read this, And now what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized, that's exactly the same as um, verse 18, right? He got up and was baptized. But look at what, this was Paul now doing his own testimony in Jerusalem. He said, Ananias told me, now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized. There's these words that are very powerful. And wash your sins away calling on His name. So, if you read verse 18 of chapter 9, He got up and was baptized. There is nothing about sin, being forgiven from sin, right? But in Acts chapter 22, the reason why Paul is getting up 
the reason Paul is getting baptized is because he needs his sins to be washed away. So meaning all this time, from meeting Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, from being blinded, all this time from reaching Damascus and staying there for three days, all this time that he was praying and fasting, he's still a sinner. Based on this verse, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Put this in mind, church. We're going to go back here, right? Because we're going to ask the question, when was Paul converted? Was he converted on his way to Damascus? Was he converted when he reached Damascus? When was he converted? And the question when, if answered, will show us how Paul was converted. So when, when Paul was converted, whether we haven't really answered it, whether on his way to Damascus, whether when he was in Damascus or three days after he was in Damascus, when he was converted, the Scripture continues with what the work of Paul started after his conversion. Look at this. In verse 20, the Scripture tells us at once, so when, when Paul received Jesus Christ in his life, when the conversion process is complete, when he was added to the body, right? at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Can you imagine this? Paul is going to the synagogue to, to arrest those who are following Jesus Christ. But when he was converted at once, right? he went to the synagogue and he is now preaching Jesus as the Son of God. This is very powerful what a conversion will do to the life of a person. Right? What Jesus Christ can do to a life of a person. From chief persecutor to chief proclamator. That's what happened to Apostle Paul. But the conversion of soul is also valuable for the insights we can glean in the process of conversion. With that in mind, allow me to share with you the conversion observations. Right? Because that's what we really are looking also as well, right? But I would not like to take this effort we are having, doing, you know, looking at the patterns of each conversion without me telling you first how the life of Paul was changed, right? It's a miracle from chief persecutor to chief proclamator because he met Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus. But if we look at this intently, conversion observations concerning when Saul was saved. Right? On the road to Damascus or after he arrived in Damascus. This is very important because this will answer how one is converted, how one is added to the body. It is often stated that Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. Right? When the Lord appeared to him, right? that his conversion took place at that moment. Right? So, but we clearly see right, that the Lord needed to tell him some more. Instructions is, go to Damascus first. Right? And I will tell you what to do. And Acts chapter 22, we're going to go back to this verse, right? We saw Acts chapter 9. And this is the great thing about the harmony of this, this narrative from Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 22, Paul himself is talking here and he's giving his own testimony. Acts chapter 9, it was Luke writing the narrative of his conversion. But this was Paul himself. He said, when, when, when Ananias came to him, this was the instructions of Ananias. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So I think this is clear, church, right? 
that even though Paul was there in Damascus for the last three days, he was blind, he did not eat or drink, he was probably praying, he was probably fasting, but at no point in those three days, Apostle Paul was forgiven from his sins. He was still a sinner. Are we following church? Because the instruction of Ananias when he came, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Get up! Right? Come on! Get baptized! So that your sins will be washed away. It is the same answer of Apostle Peter. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. The idea of being saved, the, the idea there is you are a sinner, you, have, you are still sinful, and you need to be forgiven from your sins. You need to have your sins washed away. And the only time Paul was forgiven from his sins is when he got up and when he got baptized. This is Apostle Paul who wrote 13 more epistles in the New Testament. This is the same Apostle Paul who said in Romans chapter 3, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God for the wages of sin is death. This is the same Apostle Paul who said, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That faith there needs three things. Believing, repenting, and getting baptized so that your sins will be washed away. Concerning how Saul was saved. Saul was not saved by virtue of the vision on the road. His understanding who Jesus is changed on the road there was an encounter with God on the road to Damascus. There was a realization of who Jesus is in his life. But the work of salvation is not yet complete in Saul's life. Because his sins have not been washed away. Right? Saul was not saved by virtue of prayers and fasting. Right? He had offered for three days. Can you imagine this? Saul was already praying and fasting. This is quite clear in the scriptures. And yet he is still in his sins. Hence, he still is not saved. Right? And hence, he is still not added to the body. Right? Saul was saved when his sins were washed away. How can, how can you be saved if your sins have not been washed away? You cannot even enter first step in heaven. If this is this demarcation line here and this is heaven, if you are still a sinner, you cannot even enter. Just that first step, you cannot, you cannot even take that. There is no, not even an iota of sin that is present in heaven. That's why we need to be washed away from our sins. We need to be covered by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So at, at the moment of, of baptism, we are identifying ourselves with the death, burial, perfect picture word, right? And resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So we are not anymore condemned from our sins because we have been washed away from our sins, right? Consistent all throughout Brothers, what shall we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized. Ananias said, oh, oh, what are you waiting for? Are you? The eunuch said, stop! What is keeping me from being baptized? Right? Paul got up. He got baptized. His sins are washed away. And he started proclaiming 
the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, we learn, we learn that one is not saved by visions of the Lord or saying sinner's prayer. One is saved when they believed, when they repented, and they are baptized to have your sins or their sins washed away. Have you had your own road to Damascus experience already? Maybe you have not heard an audible voice tell you, Brian, Brian, why do you persecute me? But as I said earlier, we met our Lord Jesus Christ. We encountered Him. Right? And, and I submit to you if, if you, if you haven't tracked, traversed your road to Damascus yet, I pray to God that this church here, this, this gathering here of people this afternoon is your road to Damascus. Right? And you are there sitting down, right? And in your life today, uh, you know that even though you probably you know Jesus Christ, but you don't know Him personally. Right? Or even if you know Him, you have not, you've been praying, right? you have this vision of who Jesus Christ is. But our message for this afternoon is a very strong message. Right? You need, you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. You must be baptized so that your sins will be washed away. Right? I'm hoping I can be Ananias telling you, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. And wash away your sins. I will be bold. As I can be bold this afternoon, as God would allow us, this is Saul of Tarsus, right? one of the greatest missionaries of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? His conversion was not hidden from all of us. In fact, there are three accounts of his conversion. Right? And it is clear when he was converted that Paul needed to believe in Jesus Christ. He met Jesus Christ on his way to Damascus. That he prayed for three days. He repented from his sins all those three days. But he needed to be baptized. So his sins will be washed away. So that the conversion would be complete. So that he can be added to the body. If anyone of you here, church, right? This is your road to Damascus. Who has not believed in Jesus Christ yet? Who has not repented from his or her sins yet? And who has not been baptized so that your sins will be washed away. I tell you this afternoon, what are you waiting for? Get up. Wash away your sins. Let's all stand up, church. Right? Let's give glory to God. I am so thankful of the Word of God. It's a blessing to us. right? It's not that it's not clear. It's very clear. It's always there. It's always been there. We just need to be bold to preach it. And that is the message of God this afternoon. Anyone of you here who would like to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life, to repent from his sins, to be baptized so that you will receive the gift of, of salvation so that you can be added to the body today, the scripture tells us, is the day of salvation. Let's sing this song, church. Give glory to God.